In this video, we're going to look at the plasma membrane structure and function. So the main role of the plasma membrane is to regulate what comes in and out of the cell. Uh, so we're going to look at the structure of the membrane, and we're going to look at the different types of things that need to move in and out of the cell, and the different ways in which they do that. So first, let's look at the structure. The uh, plasma membrane is made of phospholipids. Uh, phospho because there's a phosphate group and lipid because it's made of lipids. Uh, lipids is something we'll learn about in the next unit on biological molecules. It's a bilayer which means two layers and it has proteins embedded in it. So there's a, a phospholipid molecule. It's often drawn really simply like this, with a little ball for the head and two branches down, which represent these hydrophobic nonpolar tails. And so the phospholipid bilayer is a whole bunch of these phospholipid molecules. And it's a bilayer, which means you also have phospholipids down here with their hydrophobic tails facing each other. We'll look at that more closely on the next slide. So this model we have for the plasma membrane is sometimes called the fluid mosaic model. And it's called the fluid part comes from the phospholipids themselves, which are quite fluid, and they have the consistency of, of uh, uh, oil. And the mosaic part comes from all the proteins that are embedded in it, making a pattern like a mosaic. <clears throat> uh, there's different kinds of proteins that make up this mosaic, uh, but basically we can divide them into two categories. We can Those proteins that span the entire membrane, and those are called transmembrane proteins. Other words for it, intrinsic proteins, and the word that IB usually uses is integral proteins. So, and then the other types of protein <clears throat> are the ones that are just on the outside or the inside of the plasma membrane. So if there's a, a protein embedded down here, only on one side, it's called a peripheral protein. Prefer peripheral because it's on the periphery, it's on the outside. So the phospholipid that we drew is a simple ball with a couple of tails. If we look more closely at it, <clears throat> the, the head of the phospholipid is, has, a, has a charge to it. And you can see why it has a charge. It's got a, there's a phosphate group there, okay, and there's an NH3 group there. And the fact that it's charged means that it's polar. And I'll just take a second to explain what polar means. You might have learned last year that some compounds are covalent, which means that electrons are shared between atoms. Water would be an example of that. Here's water, H2O. And you might know that these lines represent bonding electrons that are being shared. But what you, what you probably didn't learn is that these electrons are not being shared equally. Sometimes atoms have a stronger pull on the electrons than the other atoms in the compound. In this case, oxygen has a stronger pull on the electrons. So those electrons get pulled towards the oxygen. And we represent that with an arrow, and we put a little line through there. It kind of looks like a plus sign. <clears throat> we can do one on the other side too. And so if the electrons are being pulled towards the oxygen, that means that the negative charge is being concentrated around the oxygen. And so even though this entire molecule of water is neutral, there's kind of a negative end to it, or negative pull. And if the electrons are being pulled away from the hydrogens, well, that's like a positive pull. And so we would say that this molecule is polar. <clears throat> 
And if there was another water nearby, well, how do you think that these positive poles are going to interact with the negative poles of a neighboring molecule? Well, they're going to be attracted to one another. And this is called a hydrogen bond. And it's a good thing that water is polar. Because <laughs> if water wasn't polar, then we wouldn't get these hydrogen bonds. And if we didn't get these hydrogen bonds, then these molecules wouldn't be as attracted to one another. And water wouldn't be a liquid at room temperature. And water drops wouldn't form as readily. <clears throat> so that's what means to be polar. So as you can see from the waters here, polar molecules are attracted to other polar molecules. So if this head of our phospholipid is polar, it means it's going to be attracted to water. And that's where this word hydrophilic comes from. Hydro means water, and philic means loving, technically water loving. And then if we look at these two branches, these two long hydrocarbon chains, well, these are not polar. So this is our nonpolar tail, and because it's not polar, it's hydrophobic, which literally means water fearing. So if you'd had a, a few of these phospholipid molecules, and you were to put them in water, they would al arrange themselves in such a way so that these polar heads were pointing towards the water molecules, and these hydrophobic tails were pointing away from the water molecules. <clears throat> and what's kind of neat is if we took a whole bunch of these phospholipid molecules, they would self-assemble into a bilayer like this, where the hydrophobic regions face each other on the inside, and the hydrophilic regions point towards the outside. And that's why it's called a phospholipid bilayer. In animal cells, we find wedged between the phospholipid molecules cholesterol. And cholesterol's role is to reduce fluidity. And we tend to think of cholesterol as a bad thing in our diet, and it's true. We don't have, want to have too much cholesterol, but it is important in our cell membranes to reduce the fluidity. So we'll talk a little bit about some of these proteins that are embedded in the phospholipid bilayer. And depending on the textbook or website you're looking at, these might be organized slightly differently, but their functions are still the same. So we have channel proteins, which as the name suggests, provides a channel from the inside to the outside of the cell. Uh, so these proteins have to span the membrane, so they're integral proteins. And uh, this might include so uh, for molecules to move through them, through these channels passively, that means no energy is required. So if, they're, if the molecules are just diffusing along a concentration gradient from high concentration to low concentration, they might go through these channel proteins. Um, but included in the channel proteins are these pumps. Um, and this would be if you're if the cell is trying to pump something against the concentration gradient, then that requires energy in the form of ATP. It's called a pump. Okay, example. An example would be uh, the sodium and potassium pumps in your neurons, which we'll learn about later in the course. Another uh, group of proteins in the plasma membrane are the electron carrier proteins. This is a whole a series of proteins, both integral and peripheral, that act to carry the electrons. And these are important in photosynthesis 
and cellular respiration. And we'll learn more about that later in the course as well. We also have cell recognition proteins. So these are cells that, uh, sorry, these are proteins that um, help the body to identify self. So these might be um, glycoproteins. So if this is your lipid bilayer, and there might be a protein, a peripheral protein embedded here, and it might have carbohydrates attached to it, a carbohydrate chain. And if so, it would be called a glycoprotein. Glyco, it's all one word, glycoprotein. Glyco refers to the carbohydrate and protein because it's also a protein. It might also, your textbook might also call it a polysaccharide chain. But it's the same thing. Um, okay, and th these are very important in your immune response. So if, if you, if for example, you receive an organ, if you need an, uh, an organ donated to you, the cells in that organ might have a slightly different composition of these proteins, which means that your immune system may not recognize these, these cells as self, as being part of you. And they might think that these cells are attacking you and turn against them, which is why sometimes when people get organ donations, they need to take immunosuppressant drugs to weaken their immune system so they don't so they don't kill the organ that's supposed to be helping them another type of protein in the membrane is receptor proteins these are for uh, receiving things like hormones and uh, finally enzymatic proteins uh, enzymes catalyze chemical reactions in the cell or outside of the cell and some of these are embedded in the membrane. An example would be the enzyme ATP synthetase, synthetase which uh, you might be able to guess from the name is an enzyme that makes or synthesizes ATP. Um, maltase. Maltase is an enzyme that breaks down maltose which is a uh, type of sugar. Okay, so these enzymes are embedded in the plasma membrane. Uh, here's an image of the electron carrier proteins. You can see the electrons here. Okay, and this is, we'll just say for now that this is important in cellular respiration and photosynthesis. And here we have uh, <clears throat> an image of some of those different types of proteins we just mentioned. Here's one that's a little better than the drawing I made. There it would be a glycoprotein. Here's the carbohydrate chains coming off of it. Uh, we have a transport protein. So molecules can move through that. Uh, we have a, a gated channel protein. Uh, so this is something that might carry uh, ions like sodium or potassium. Uh, channel protein, which is always open. So something through a channel protein like this, uh, something would diffuse, if it's always open, something could diffuse through it from high to low concentration. So it would be following the concentration gradient and it wouldn't require energy to uh, diffuse through that. Okay, there's not too many molecules that can that can move directly through the phospholipid membrane. Some very small molecules like oxygen and CO2 can do it. And that's what they do in you know in the in your lungs and the alveoli in your lungs. Most molecules or ions need to move through some kind of protein. Here's a receptor protein, so this would be for receiving a hormone, for example. And they've 
they've drawn it with this little wedge on top to indicate that that's a specific shape. So whatever it is that it's meant to receive has to have that specific shape to fit in there. Okay, and once it fits in there, that might trigger a series of metabolic reactions inside the cell. So we think about all the things that have to move back and forth across that cell membrane. We've got waste products, um, such as ammonia. We've got sugar, different kinds of sugars, amino acids. Uh, some hormones. Um, what deter so the factors that determine how a substance may be transported across the membrane, the size. If it's too big, it, it can't diffuse through. It has to get into the cell a different way, which we'll talk about later. Uh, also, whether it's polar or nonpolar. So things that are polar. Um, Little ions, which are ions which are charged, so like sodium or potassium, fluoride. These ions don't diffuse through the lipid bilayer because of the hydrophobic region in the middle, the nonpolar region in the middle. Okay. So these need a protein to move through. Now here's some examples uh, to show particles moving into the cell in a passive way. So these are all, all of these pictures here show passive transport, which means no energy. And when we say energy, what we're talking about is the molecule ATP, which supplies the energy. No ATP required. So, as I mentioned before, some very small molecules like O2 and CO2 might diffuse directly through the membrane. Um, in some cases, uh, polar and charged molecules, so ions, diffuse through channels. Uh, as long as they're working with the concentration gradient, they can do this. Otherwise, they need to be pumped across, and that would require energy. And then we've got facilitated transport, which is a little different. You've got a protein embedded here, an integral protein with a specific shape to it. When the molecule enters, it causes the protein to reconfigure its shape. It closes up on one end and opens up on the other end. And that, that's just because of the interaction between the the molecule and the protein itself. It still doesn't require energy. Okay, and this is glucose is an example of a molecule that enters the cell by facilitated transport. It's called facilitated because facilitated means you know kind of helped, helped along, and that's what these proteins do. So it doesn't require energy, but these proteins are needed. And there's a table in the Biology 12 textbook which highlights the passage of molecules into and out of the cell and it shows examples where energy is not required, like we just saw in the previous diagram, and some examples where energy is required. So an ion pump would be an example we've already talked about. And then two other examples which we haven't talked about yet, these would be for substances which are too large even to make it through a protein so exocytosis and endocytosis these are processes where the cell membrane has to change its shape and uh, a vesicle is formed and we'll get to that in in a few slides so we'll stop this part one of this video here in the next video we'll take a, a closer look at diffusion and osmosis